Oh, this is everyone. Right? That's good. I know awesome stuff. Yes. <laughs> I um, just get this thing opened up. Doing quite well with my glasses. It's amazing, you know, there's often stories in the Bible that we read through and we actually just read over them and we read past them. We don't think a lot about them. They're great stories that make us feel good. You know, some of the stories we, we even consider that are, are more for kids than for adults. And I want to look at a story today found in Luke. And it's probably one of those stories. It's a story about Jesus and Zacchaeus. But for most of us, it really is a story that we saw in Sunday school. Now, for most of us in this room, you're like me, where we didn't have wonderful projectors and screens like this when we were in Sunday school, we had felt boards. And they used to have the felt board up the front and had the little tree with a little Jesus and his crowd walking along and little Zacchaeus in the tree. And it really was just a story about a short man that wanted to see Jesus. And that's really all we took away from it. But I look at this story and I think, you know, there's some amazing things that God has put in this that I think Jesus was actually, and the, the writers were very particular in what they recorded. So we're just going to have a look at Luke 19, verses 1 to 9. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. There's so many reasons really why I like this story. One of them is that last phrase, because it really does totally destroy our theology. You go, well, how do you do that? See, for most of us, and don't get me wrong, this is exactly how I just started my journey of faith. We say a prayer. Someone talks to us about Jesus, and we say a prayer, and we ask Jesus into our heart. What I love about this is there's no record of Zacchaeus saying a prayer. There's no record of Zacchaeus doing anything other than having Jesus call him down from the tree. And Zacchaeus says, today, I'm going to do this. Give away all this wealth that I've stolen. And Jesus looks at him and says, you know what? Today salvation's found you. What I love about it is we, that for you and I, we look on the outside. You see, God looks at the heart. Jesus could look down and he saw the change that took place in Zacchaeus' heart right there and then. And that's what, what makes the difference in our lives. That's what turns us from the life that we were living to a life following Christ. Now, this story starts in, a, in an interesting way. It's Jesus coming through Jericho. And it says that he, he saw this man who was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. I love the fact that it's very specific in what it says about Zacchaeus. Because I like that for two reasons. Because being a tax collector, not sure if you're aware of this, but in that day he was one of the most hated men ever to live. He was hated by his own people because he would steal from them. And he was hated by the Romans because he had collected tax. But he didn't get paid by the Romans to collect tax, so... When he had a big night on the town, he used to up the tax the next day and put a bit in his pocket. And that's how Zacchaeus made his living. He was so wealthy because he stole from his own people. So everybody absolutely hated him with such a passion. It also mentions that he was short. Now... So mean. It's horrible to talk about short people. And you sort of think to yourself, why would the Bible bother to tell us that Zacchaeus was short? I think there's more to Zacchaeus being short than we think of. You know, for most of us in this modern day society, we know of this thing called small man syndrome. We refer to it as small man syndrome, but what it really is, is someone's got a chip on their shoulder. When you think about Zacchaeus' life, he's living in Jericho. He's hated by everyone in Jericho. I'm sure he had a chip on his life, on his shoulder. There was things that he didn't like. You know, I don't think he climbed the tree because he was short. I think he climbed the tree because he didn't feel welcome to be anywhere around near Jesus. He didn't feel that the crowds were accepting. 
But it's interesting because Jesus was travelling along with this wonderful crowd of people. You know, in this crowd were the 12 disciples and uh, also in this crowd were the 70 that followed him everywhere. Then you had in this crowd, you know, those that um, we might call the freeloaders, those that uh, had heard that, you know, Jesus has been known to feed the 5,000 and been known to feed the 4,000 and we'll follow him today because we might get a free feed. But then there's this other group of people that are walking with Jesus, the ones that most of us don't like, you know, the, the gossips and the busybodies. Uh, you know, in this day and age, they might be the, the news reporters or the, the people like that. You know, they're the ones that, when Jesus stopped and said Zacchaeus, the first thing they did was pull out their mobile phones and take a photo and said, oh, put it on social media. Guess who Jesus is just standing with? Who's Jesus talking to? Trying to run him down. You've got these people. But what I love is that Jesus, amongst all of this going on, didn't really care about any of that. All he was interested in was Zacchaeus. He looks at Zacchaeus and he says, come down. One of the things that I find amazing is that, again, the Bible's very particular in what it says. It says that Zacchaeus was in a sycamore tree. A sycamore tree that it talks about is one that's got lots of foliage, which means you can hide extremely well. You know, one of the things that for most of us, when COVID hit as a church, we hated COVID. But for me, I actually don't mind it. Because what it's done is it's generated every church to do live feeds. Because, see, there's plenty of people that don't want to walk into this door because they don't feel welcome or they don't feel worthy. But they'll sit at home and scroll through and, ah, oh, churches of Christ in Caboolture, who are they? What are they doing? And they log on and they begin to watch. They begin to see. So that's really what Zacchaeus was doing. He was hiding to see what was going on. He wanted to know more about this fellow Jesus but didn't feel worthy. And for most of us, that's really where we were at prior to fighting Christ. You know, everyone says that old thing that, you know, if I walk into church, the walls are going to fall down. I love it when churches do food pantries because it means that people are actually walking into the doors. You can look at them and go, hey, listen, the roof's still here. <laughs> You're welcome to come back. It didn't fall in. Because people genuinely think that. They believe that I've done such bad things in my life. There's no way I could walk into a church. There's no way this God would ever forgive me for what I've done. I've encountered many fellows that have thought this way, that have thought there's nothing that I could ever do that would, would cause God to love me. So Jesus is walking along, and there's a couple of miracles that take place. A, that as Zacchaeus is hiding, Jesus sees him. But not only that, Jesus didn't just see him, he knew his name. I mean, the Bible says that Zacchaeus came down out of the tree, but I wonder if he actually fell out of the tree. Well, so here he is hiding, and all of a sudden Jesus just stops and looks up and says, Zacchaeus, today I must eat at your place. I mean, imagine the shock that took place. I mean, Zacchaeus was hiding because he'd heard of the stories of Jesus. He knew how powerful Jesus was. He knew what type of a person Jesus was. And here's Jesus saying, oh, I want to have food with you today, Zacchaeus. I want to eat with you today. Jesus could have been eating with anyone. He could have been eating with the Lord there of, of Jericho. He could have been eating with the wealthy. But he chose not to. He chose to do something that most of us don't like. And what he chose to do was to accept Zacchaeus. Because that's really what Jesus was doing. When Jesus called out Zacchaeus' name and asked him to come down, he was demonstrating a huge amount of acceptance to Zacchaeus. Another word for acceptance really is love. That Jesus was demonstrating the love that he had. That that love went to no bounds. It didn't matter who was watching. It didn't matter what bad media result reports were going to go out about him. He didn't care who was watching. Jesus just wanted to love and demonstrate that love to Zacchaeus. It's interesting that for most of us, we struggle with that. We struggle to demonstrate love to people because we struggle to accept who they are. One of the reasons we struggle to accept who they are because we have this big issue in our life where if I accept you, then I'm condoning what you've done. That type of mentality becomes an absolute nightmare for someone that goes into a prison as a prison chaplain. <laughs> because when you're walking around, there's no way I condone what any of those fellas have done. I've met some fellas, I've visited blokes, you named a crime, and I've probably visited someone that's done that. Did I condone that? Absolutely not. Did I love them as a person? Absolutely. You can see the gold that was in them. When you begin to sit and chat with these fellows, you begin to hear who they are, begin to see what God loves about them. You begin to see them through the eyes of Jesus. And that's what Jesus was doing in this story. He was looking 
at Zacchaeus through the eyes of the cross. He was looking at Zacchaeus and saying, man, I love you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. You're worthy. You're worth everything. You're worth it for me. But the other thing I like about this story is that Jesus says, I want to have food with you. I want to eat with you. For us Christians, that's absolutely brilliant because we love our food. Let's be honest. I mean, we, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't party, we don't do any of that, but man, we can eat. <laughs> and Jesus is giving us a ticket here saying, hey, go and eat. But I love the fact that Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus, I want to eat with you because something takes place when you share a meal with someone. You know, like the Bible talks a lot about breaking bread and for most of the part in the Bible when it says breaking bread, we assume and we think that he's talking about communion. And yes, there's plenty in the Bible where he is talking about communion. But there's also plenty of areas in Scripture where God's actually talking about breaking bread in having a meal with people. I was probably one of the most blessed chaplains in far north Queensland, or in Queensland altogether, to be honest. Um, I started visiting a bloke uh, in prison back in 2013. It all came out of a really a miracle. I walked into a unit one day, and there was a young fellow. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he'd had a sore elbow. And I'm sitting there talking with him, and I was tired. I'd been in jail for about 8 or 9 hours at this point. And I was pretty worn out. I'd been working the day before, so I was tired, and I was really just looking forward to going home. But I know the Bible says that when someone's sick, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So I didn't have any faith in me, but I thought the Bible says pray, so I'm going to pray. So I reached out and said, mate, do you mind if I pray for your elbow? He said, yeah, go for it. I said, now I'm just the type of person I like to put my hand on someone when I pray. Is that all right? He said, yeah, that's all right. So I just put my hand on his shoulder and just prayed that God would heal his elbow. Thought nothing more of it. Got up, walked out. Whole week went by, I go into jail the next week and I walk into his unit and this older flock like makes a beeline for me and he points at me and goes, you, you're a healer. I said, what do you mean? I'm a chaplain. He goes, no, no. He said, you come into our unit and name the unit. He said, that young fellow, you prayed for his elbow. I said, oh, yeah. He goes, pain totally left and was totally healed after you left. I went, wow. Praise God. But that started the journey with this fellow where when he moved into the farm, I went to visit him at the farm. I used to go to the prison from about 8 o'clock in the morning until about 4.30 and then go over to the farm at 5 and stay at the farm until about 8 o'clock at night. But when he got there, he felt bad for me because I didn't eat. So he started to share his dinner with me. And then all of a sudden at the farm, they, they have the opportunity where they actually cook for themselves. So one of the jobs is you become a cook of your unit. So he spoke to the cook and he said, I want you to take some of my food and give it to Darren. That started a great relationship for me with this cook for the next few years and with the blokes that at the farm for the next six years where every Thursday night they cooked a meal for me. And it wasn't until I left the prison and I was, I don't know where I was, but I was driving and I remember God saying to me specifically, think about all the blokes that you've sat and had a meal with. Think about all the fellows that have cooked for you while you've been at the farm. So I did. And they all come to mind. He said, now think about all the other fellows that you've spoken to in the prison. And I did. He goes, is there a difference in the relationship? And I went, you're spot on, there is. Every person that cooked me a meal and sat down at the table and ate with me and we communicated over a meal, I have a deeper and a stronger friendship and relationship with. It was a light bulb moment for me where God was sort of saying, this is an opportunity for you. When you actually go and eat with people, you begin to share, you begin to demonstrate who you are. I mean, you've got to imagine, I've got in these fellas, I mean, some of them are so far away from God. I remember this one unit, there was a cook, he was there for about three years. And uh, he was a really cook. Like he could, man, he could cook. He made me a mango cheesecake with four ingredients that you would just, man, I'll tell you, you'd die for it. He made these beautiful chocolate eclairs. He knew how to cook. But he was a rough bloke, wanted nothing to do with God. But in that unit, when they would sit down, they'd sit at the table, they'd all be sitting there, and they'd just wait. Because what they were waiting for was me to say, do you mind if I say grace before I eat? And every week was the same thing. I'd ask them every week, and every week they'd say the same thing. That's what we're waiting for, Darren. It's the only night of the week that they would not eat until I had said grace. It was an opportunity. And over those meals, we began to have conversations about Jesus. We began to talk about who he was, what he's done. Because I was just, you know, when you have a meal with someone, the walls go down, you begin to relax. You begin to feel and, and talk to people. You begin to open up. So I love that Jesus, Jesus is really telling us in this story. Here's a ticket to go and have food with people. Here's a ticket to go and eat. We should take that up. Now, how many neighbours do we have that we don't eat with? How many people are there out there that we could actually demonstrate the love of God just by inviting them for a meal? 
Because really the whole story of Zacchaeus is all based around Jesus extending love and acceptance. We might not understand what that means. We might not understand how could just Jesus saying to Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. I mean, there's no record at the point when Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give everything back. It's, the story indicates that it's still happening at the foot of the tree. So all of a sudden, just through the fact that Jesus has said this to Zacchaeus, it's changed his heart. You know, when we begin to accept people, remember I walked into a unit one day and I met this bloke. He's an interesting bloke. He's about this tall, about six foot wide. He's a bodybuilder. He was a big looking lad. And we walked in and just struck up a conversation. It was his it's the first time I'd met him in the jail. We'd get to talk and it didn't take me long to realise that he was a Satanist. He made it very clear to me that he praised the name of Satan and that um, Satan was, you know, more powerful than the God that I served. And Darren, you should cross over because you're serving the weaker of the two. So we had this wonderful conversation and I had two choices at that moment. I could have done what probably most of us Christians would ordinarily do and that's begin to get really agitated and upset that you would even dare say that the devil is more powerful than my God, that we would begin to get on our high horse and begin to, you know, berate them for their opinions. I had that choice. There's part of me that wanted to take that route. But God overtook me and said, no, I want you to do this. I just want you to listen. I just want you to begin a conversation down. Which I did. And I'm glad I did because I learned some interesting things. I learned One of the things I learned was the reason he had that opinion of God was because when he was a, a young boy, a dear family member had passed away from cancer and they'd been praying and God didn't heal him. So he was now blaming God for that person passing away. Throughout his life, he's come to realise that you know, in his life, he decided that Satan was the nice one and that God was the mean one. Now, I would never have known that if I didn't take the time to build a relationship with him. But we ended that conversation after about 45 minutes and I walked away and as I walked out, I made a point of noting how he spelt his name on the board so I could pray for him. And I did. I began to pray for him, pray that God had really touched him. A couple of months went by and I walked into another unit. Now, this particular unit, when you walk in, to give you an idea what jail is like, you walk into, through the door, so as you walk into the unit this way, right to your left is what they call the fishbowl, it's where the officer sits to watch everything. You have 25 units in a U-shape out this way, and then another top deck with another 25 units. Directly in front of you is some tables that you sit down for meals, and then behind that is some, want of a better word, some metal lounge chairs. Then you walk through about two or three metres, and then there's a door to the left that leads to an exercise yard. The exercise yard is completely concrete and it has a cage surrounding it. So as I walk in, I glanced out, as I usually did, just to see who was in the yard, and I saw this fella with a younger bloke. And just something all of a sudden came over me that said, you're in for it. And there's part of me that just wanted to turn around right there and then and walk out, but I thought, no, I'll keep going. And I only got another step or two and made these two blokes came in. Where are you going, Darren? Let's have a chat. Are you willing to chat? Yeah, all right. So he sat down at a table. I sat down facing the officer, and then there was a table here. The big fella sat there, and the, the younger fella sat next to me. We began a conversation. This conversation started to get a little bit heated. The young fella really was disappointed at my opinion on, on God and my opinion and my faith in God and, and my opinion and lack of faith in their God. Uh, turns out both of them were Satanists. And it got to the point where I'm sitting there at one moment thinking, this young fella, because he was really getting agitated, I'm thinking, man, he's going to hit me. And you know, there's that moment in life where you'd like to think, God, I'm willing to do anything for you. I'll take a beating for you, Jesus. And I'm sitting there going, God, I really, I don't. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking, oh, I'll be really good, and I'll, you know, so I'm saying, God, if I really had to, I probably would endure, but... And I sort of probably said that because I knew there was a really big but that I was going to argue with God. And so I looked at God and said, but, imagine a chaplain getting hit in that prison. Imagine the hassles there to stop us having this privilege here, Lord. Like, something's got to happen. And at that moment, as I'm having this dialogue in my mind with God, the door opens and some senior officers walk in. They walk in to do a cell search. Generally, everyone has to leave unless you're a prisoner or an officer. So the senior walked in and I said, hey, boss, what would you like me to do? He goes, ah, oh, you're all right, Darren, just sit there, don't move. We'll only be about 10 minutes. I went, you little ripper, that's the favour of God. 
So they did what they had to do, then the two fellas came back, but this time they sat, both sat opposite me, and I'm thinking, God, you're brilliant, this is awesome. There's no chance they can hit me from across the table. <laughs> but throughout this time, the conversation had gotten heated, um, heated on their behalf. So there, I noticed that when they came back, there was about half a dozen other blokes that sort of come, but they were all standing around me. I realised at the end of it, because one of them had said to me, did you notice that we were standing in a half circle around you? We had your back, chaplain. I'm like, this is awesome. But at one point, there's a bloke, the, the, um, an African bloke from Sierra Leone, and he started talking about his journey. And I tell you, man, you've never heard the gospel preached the way this bloke preached it. There was that many Fs, and it wasn't the word faith, and he was just going for it. But his story was that over in Sierra Leone, he dated this girl, and this girl's grandmother was a witch doctor. And they were out one day and this vicious, ferocious dog was chasing and coming to attack them. And so the grandmother put a curse on this dog and it dropped dead mid-flight. Then he upset the grandmother's daughter and broke her heart, so now grandmother's put a curse on him. And he panicked. And he thought, what do I do? He said, so I went to a church. He said, and I'm still alive. There must be a God because I'm still alive. And you sit back and you go, wow, Lord, like... It's not the way I would have preached the gospel, but that was his journey. He believed that God was real because this witch doctor put a curse on him and he's still alive. So this conversation with these two blokes went for about two and a half hours. At the end of it, the big fella stood up, put his hand out to me, shook my hand. He said, Darren, you've been a formidable opponent. Thank you for your time. I've got to go and work out and walk off. And I'm like, okay. The young fella sort of stayed for a couple of minutes and then he walked off. But over the next couple of weeks... They got separated in the jail and the young fella actually ended up giving his heart to the Lord. Uh, another prisoner had led him to the Lord. I'd, I'd had a couple more meetings with him and, and we'd spoken. And then one week while I wasn't in prison, a, a, a prisoner had sort of taken him through and led him to the Lord. And that's awesome. But the other fella, I mean, he was full of hurt, full of hate. But it started a relationship with us all because I accepted him and I loved on him. I didn't condone what he said. I didn't agree with what he said. He'd walk up to me every time he saw me in the prison. He'd walk up, he'd do that horrible sign, put his arm in the air, and he'd go, praise the name of Satan, Darren. And I'd look at him with a big smile on my face and say, no way, brother, praise the name of Jesus. And then at that point, he'd come and he'd give me a big bear hug and he'd go, I love you, bro. Why? Because I loved on him. He was seeing a different type of God. See, Paul says in, I think it's in Corinthians, that our lives are a letter written. I can't remember who it was, but there's a famous preacher that said, Preach the gospel every day and use words if you have to. It should be our actions. It should be who we are that preaches the gospel. And it doesn't matter at what age we're at. You know, as a young child, you can reach out and touch someone's life. As someone that's nearing the grave, you can reach out and touch someone's life. And everywhere in between, we have the opportunity to reach out and touch someone's life. Now, at one point, this bloke, he was telling me that his dad had been quite sick. So in the middle of a maximum security prison, on a walkway, I said... Do you mind if I pray for your dad? He said, oh, that would be all right, Darren. I said, now I like to pray with, and, and I like to just put my hand on someone. Do you mind if I do that? That's all right. So here's this six, foot, and a six and a half foot bloke, massive bloke, Satanist in the middle of the prison, allowing me to put my hand on him and pray for his dad. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing here, but this is awesome. And then a couple of months later, just before he got out, we're walking up a walkway and he's telling me that he was getting out in a few months and he's like, I'm going to start a satanic church now. Really? He goes, yeah, I want you to come along. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, um, you're aware I'm a pastor and a chaplain? He goes, yeah. I said, so you're aware that I'm going to bring my God with me? Yeah, that's all right. I love you, bro. I want you to come. And I'm like, see, I didn't realise, but, but just my love and my acceptance of him was, was beginning to win through, was beginning to win over and to change his opinion on who God was. Because to, up until he'd met me, the only idea of God that he had was this horrible, mean God that took this life of a loved family member. And like most of us, you know, most people go to church and, and you walk in, if you don't look normal when you walk into a church, you don't get spoken to. And this church is probably different, but there's plenty of churches where you don't. You walk in and, and then you walk out again without speaking to anyone, and he may have done that. But just through me demonstrating God's love by saying, I don't agree with you, and I didn't. He knew very well that I didn't agree with any of his opinions on Satan. We would have plenty of conversations about that. I would argue with him. He'd quote the Satanic Bible and I'd quote our Bible. But we had a speaking argument. We didn't 
raise voices. Because I think deep down he knew that my God was the God that he should be serving. But he was just hurt and upset. Did he ever give his heart to the Lord in front of me? I don't know. I haven't seen him for a few years. I don't know where he's at. But what I do know is that I played my part. See, for the most part, we're so caught up on the fact that we need to sign the deal. We need to see someone actually say the sinner's prayer in front of us to know that we've made a difference. But see, that's not true. Paul says in Corinthians, he says, I, Paul, sowed, Apollos watered, and the Holy Spirit added the increase. When I got a revelation of that, it actually just took a load off me. I tell you, it took a massive weight off because I realised... It's not my responsibility. My responsibility with this bloke was just to love him. There's been plenty of other times when my responsibility has been to to talk to them about how to start their journey of faith and to lead them through a sinner's prayer. And I've had the privilege of of leading plenty of men inside prison. But not everyone I've spoken to, that's been what God's asked me to do. Sometimes I'm just watering a seed. Sometimes I'm sowing the seed. And that's for us in life. And my biggest message that I would love to get across to everyone in the entire world is that if we just actually love people for who they are, not what they do, but love them for who they are, they're children of God. They're created in the image of God. Are they doing evil, horrible things? Absolutely. But our responsibility is to do exactly what Jesus did to the most hated man in Jericho, and that's to say, I love you, bro. I want to eat with you tonight. I could eat with anyone, but I'm choosing to eat with you. Why? Because I think there's gold in there. It's what God does with all of us. It's what he did with me. It's what he did, I'm assuming, for most of us. We're not born Christians. At some point, we have to make a choice to start that journey of faith. And at that point, when we start that journey of faith, God's saying, there's gold in you. I love you. I want you to serve me. I want you to worship me. You know, we sung that song this morning that talks about Jesus being the ultimate. I'm trying to think which one it was because you sang a few songs. <laughs> that was it. It really is. You know, like just one day at a time. Because it's what Jesus has done for us that matters. And our role in life is to love others the way Christ has loved us. It's to accept others the way Christ has accepted us. We don't need to do anything. We don't need to say anything other than love on people. So I would encourage you to go through and have another read of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Because I find it amazing that here's this story in the Bible, but it has so much depth to it because Jesus is really demonstrating to us this is all we have to do. You know, the, the drug dealer on the street, come on, let me shed you for a coffee. Let me just demonstrate what Jesus is like. You know, the drunk that sits there that, that yells and abuses everyone. Let me come and buy you a drink or I don't smoke, but hey, let me buy you a pack of cigarettes. Maybe not that today because they're around a hundred bucks a pack. I'm thinking of years ago when they were cheaper. <laughs> but it's about demonstrating the love of Jesus. That's what Jesus did when you look through all of the Gospels. He literally walked and demonstrated his love. He showed us how we in this world can demonstrate his love to others. So I'd encourage you to begin to do that. I'd encourage you to come and have a chat with me at the end and come and sign up for our Set Free magazine because one of the brilliant ways that we demonstrate the love of Jesus is by taking that love into correctional centres in Queensland. So thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope that I've inspired you to go and make a difference in your world and begin to demonstrate the love of Jesus.